Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, really looking forward to uh, having a conversation and talking to everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I've got a short presentation, um, which I don't want to sort of drag too long, but I think it would be really good to sort of get into discussion and some questions. So I will start sharing. And hopefully that should come up on your screens. And I just need to get it full screen. So hopefully you can then see it. Uh, can you all see that? Yeah, we can. Okay, um, so uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, so uh, my name is Mark England. I'm the Head of Innovation, Maintenance and Group Procurement, uh, which basically means that I look after um, I've been with Kelvin for 21 years, um, and uh, I've previously run every part of the maintenance sort of part of the business, if you like. Um, and uh, my role now is very much around technologies and getting a better insight into people's homes to improve lives and improve our services. And the innovation side comes uh, from um, he having good relationships and setting up innovative projects where we put things like sensors in people's homes um, and we've sort of been able to sort of engage with our customers a lot more uh, and to encourage them to use digital means to uh, to sort of converse with us and to report repairs and, and other aspects. The maintenance side is uh, is just around general maintenance. So we were patients of kitchens, bathrooms, responsive repairs, uh, void properties. So that's where a property becomes empty and refurbishing those properties. And then sometimes uh, we refurbish other uh, parts of our, our business, other properties, uh, and reuse them for different things. So we, we have a homeless service, um, and uh, we're very keen sort of to, to keep that part of the business running as well as we possibly can, and to keep improving the accommodation. And then our group procurement, uh, that's all of our purchasing across the group. I take a lead role on that side of things. So this is us, so the coastline housing, so a registered social landlord, uh, obviously Cornwall based. Um, we got four and a half thousand, we're probably about 4,700 homes at this moment in time. And we've got a very mix, a, a wide mix of homes, uh, which ranges from standard general needs homes uh, right across the supported service, uh, which includes some complexes, but also includes supported accommodation where people uh, can live uh, on their own uh, with some support services coming in and out. Uh, and uh, then we have extra care and a homeless service, which I mentioned just now. And I think one of the other important um, factors of Coastline is we have an in-house maintenance contractor who carry out a lot of our repairs and maintenance, which means that we can sort of have that really close relationship with the contractor um, rather than have an adversarial sort of uh, uh, a, a, a boss and contractor type relationship. Uh, we, we tend to sort of merge all of our work and we work very well together. But it does mean that uh, they have a really good insight into our customers' homes as well uh, and are able to report issues back to us, maybe where people are vulnerable or have issues, um, and that makes things much, much simpler. So this is uh, a lot of this um, presentation really is about responsive repairs and, and about how we react to things. Um, so all landlords have a responsive repair service of some sort, uh, and we encourage our customers uh, to report any repair that they can see. So if they notice something in their home or their neighbor's home or even across the fence or maybe across the road, they spot something that uh, is, is an issue, we uh, encourage them all the time to uh, report those as repairs to us. And that means that we, we're keeping on top of our stock and we're keeping away from things like disrepair, but we're also keeping everyone safe. Um, and these are the various means that uh, our, our customers can actually um, report repairs to us. Um, and they quite often are reporting, you see there, on behalf of somebody else. And we do have quite a lot of repairs and, and issues that happen out of hours, out of normal working hours. Just to give you some sort of numbers about how responsive repairs works, uh, we do about 14,000 repairs a year, um, which is sort of uh, probably just slightly under the average across uh, housing in the country. Um, our stock is fairly well maintained and is also quite energy efficient. We've uh, managed to secure quite a lot of funding over the years and quite a good expertise across our teams. So we've kept us, our stock in, in very good condition. Whenever a repair comes in, uh, it basically gets classified immediately and prioritised as either something that's an emergency, it's, I, I, you know, it needs to be done there and then, so we tend to respond to those within two hours, uh, make safe or repair it completely if we can, um, and then go back within 24 hours to carry, carry out the final repair. 
Then we have an urgent service and a routine service you can see there, which are five and 20 days, which we're actually moving away from. We're gonna end up with a service that is it's either an emergency or it's not an emergency. Um, and a lot of that is driven by trying to be a lot more sort of open and honest about uh, repair service and not um, making people wait more than five days because we've classified you as routine when we potentially could be driving past the door uh, to go to somewhere else. It may well be something that we can complete really quickly. Average sort of cost for repairs, around £100. Uh, I think at the moment we're probably about £90, uh, maybe £89, somewhere around there for this, this financial year. Um, and that stays fairly static. We do have larger repairs that come through as well. Um, they don't always sit in this area. Uh, they sit in a slightly different sort of budgetary area because they need more planning, health and safety advice and, and, and other things. And I think one of the, the, sort of, um, the things I wanted to highlight was that um, COVID sort of the, the government regulations and changes uh, stopped us carrying out working people's homes for a period of time, unless it was an absolute emergency. But actually, it didn't reduce the number of repairs that we carried out in the full financial year. So that created a bit of a backlog. And that's something that we worked really, really quickly on uh, as soon as we could get access, get access to homes. And we moved a lot of our teams around. And again, that's one of the advantages of having an in-house maintenance contractor was that we, we could sit quite logically and work out how can we get this backlog done. And instead of in, you know, installing new kitchens and bathrooms and, and new roofs, we put those teams onto the repair service because actually that was the highest driver. That was something that really needs to be done. So just when you're sort of thinking about this data challenge, just wanted to sort of add some considerations. And this is really about the, the customer groups that we, that we service uh, and provide homes to, and you know, their situations themselves. Uh, we have customers who are in fuel poverty. We have some customers who are in, in poverty. We have some customers who have rent arrears and you know, some quite challenging sort of customers from a point of view of their lifestyles. Um, and also that sometimes they, don't report things to us uh, and that, that is really challenging for us because we want to know when the repairs or if there's a repair um, um, or something be broken and we want to be able to provide that service as fast as we can um, so sometimes we find that customers may be cautious um, and sometimes they may not report a repair we have a, a another sort of arm to this part of the business, which is uh, stock condition surveys. So every one of our homes has a survey. That's a full top to toe sort of uh, survey uh, of the property um, carried out by a surveyor uh, once every five years. And we'd like to get that site maybe uh, within every four years, but uh, we're rolling that out at the moment and we're making really good progress. And of course that means that we're proactively then uh, finding out about repairs. I mentioned in here condensation mould and the internal environment and another really important aspect in housing, which has seen a lot of negative publicity in fact uh, recently uh, and some very poor conditions in homes. And quite often, you know, I think the landlords do take the brunt of, of those sort of um, those sort of revelations, but um, quite often the landlords don't know what's going on in some of their homes and it is quite difficult to understand uh, exactly what's going on in every home. But again, you know, I, there are some unforgivable circumstances which, uh, which I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't support. One of the things that we've been doing at Coastline, is just, which is quite innovative, is uh, we're um, sending regular mould surveys now using the data from our systems of where we've had condensation reported or mould or other issues reported in a dwelling. We're picking those whole estates and getting surveys completed of them uh, to make sure that uh, we're dealing with those as quickly as possible. And it's, it's quite challenging because some of the properties, some customers um, won't let us in or don't want us to, to go in the property. And there may be varying reasons for that. And it may be all around vulnerability or that they need to have uh, some support, you know, another member of the family with them. Um, so we make those arrangements where we can. But we do get some customers who, uh, who don't really reply to us very often. And, uh, and that sort of creates a bit more of a challenging environment. Um, but we tend to not let those go. We tend to sort of keep keep sort of working with our colleagues to be able to get in. Something else to consider is that uh, we build quite a lot of new homes, uh, but we also have some quite old homes. Um, so there's a, a whole raft of different property ages and archetypes in the way that those properties are constructed. So that all those properties behave differently when you move customers into them. And as families expand in particular, the internal environment is under quite a bit of strain on an older property with uh, less insulation or retrofitted insulation. Um, and it's quite difficult if some of the heating sources are expensive, maybe uh, things 
systems around air source heat pumps, uh, which we fitted quite a lot of, but they, if they're not used properly, they can be quite expensive for customers to use, so they can turn them off. We also have some customers who have gas uh, to their homes and they sometimes turn those off as well or ask the, uh, the gas supplier to uh, cap their supply because they, they feel that it's too expensive. So it's quite a challenging environment and quite a diverse sort of environment. So what we're thinking with this project is that uh, we have got uh, absolutely heaps of data and information about our customer, uh, customers, about the properties, how the properties are constructed, what are the main features of those properties in terms of heating, insulation, the SAP, so standards assessment procedure, um, energy efficiency rating of the homes and a lot, a lot of information about the repairs themselves that we've carried out on properties. And once you get to a certain stage, I think uh, I was explaining to Tarek, I think you, you try to move along very quickly um, and it's quite difficult to build teams that can actually extrapolate this information and start pulling it apart and start to look for themes. Um, and that's really where my sort of, my, my plea comes from, if you like, my bid. Um, and that is to sort of provide us with some backup and uh, some assistance to actually start pulling this information apart and start to sort of use it in a really intelligent way um, so we can support our customers more where they need it, uh, but also sort of to flag up and may maybe reprioritize some of our stock condition surveys um, so we can get sort of those properties inspected and make sure that, uh, that everything is well. So you can see in here that there's a repairs information, the timescales that it takes to actually carry out the work, the actual work completed. So we, have, we actually have that in text. It tells you exactly which trade carried out the works, whether that's a carpenter, a plumber or, or whatever, and the type of products that they use to carry out the repair and a description of works. We also have the cost of each uh, work order. Um, geographical location of every single dwelling, uh, which you'd expect. Um, we also have household demographic, and that's quite an important uh, um, environmental sort of issue uh, with, with a home and the financial vulnerability. So we do have quite a bit of information about our customers. And the idea is that they're using a combination of this information and perhaps some other information that, uh, that we host, um, that we can actually find some really sort of good synergies uh, and try to find some, some trends. So our challenge to you, uh, if you choose to, uh, to accept it, is that uh, we want to try and highlight anything that makes a repair stand out, anything that coincides with repairs uh, or non-repairs. So we're trying to find properties where there may not be repairs reported, but actually they're more than likely to have some repairs in them. That's a really important factor for us. Uh, you know, disrepair is, is quite a serious issue. Um, and thankfully in Gorman, we don't have very many sort of disrepair um, solicitors working, but uh, we do have no win, no fee, fee uh, solicitors working you know, within Cornwall and we have had some contact from them where they lead some customers maybe slightly astray in terms of saying that there are lots of financial benefits um, if they allow them to sort of to start a disrepair case against us. And actually, we, we really don't want that. You know, our, our whole ethos um, is to try and help customers and make sure we support customers so that they can pay their bills, they can get on with their lives and have a really good life. You know, we, we're really you know, spending lots of time trying to defend against the claim, which actually is sometimes not quite as truthful as it could be, um, is wasteful from our point of view. And actually, that money could have been sort of dedicated towards our, our customers that are making sure their homes are the best possible that they can be. And I think you know, the last part there is just around the trends of higher volumes of repairs. Um, and this seems, I think, when you look at it from this perspective, it looks like it's quite a simple set of reports, but it becomes more and more complex uh, when you start the, looking at the property, the, the construction type, the person, the people who live there, the location sometimes in sort of very extreme sort of locations, maybe on the lizard peninsula compared with somewhere um, that may be perhaps in the centre of Camborne, that they're very, very different properties, although they could be identically constructed, they're under different sort of pressures. So this is sort of where we're, where we're sort of looking and trying to identify and basically be able to predict where there may be repairs in our homes that we don't know about. An additional sort of edge to the challenge is we also have lots of information about planned maintenance. So this is where we've replaced kitchens and bathrooms and uh, heating systems or even roofs or insulation. We may have put external wall insulation on the home. And what we'd like to do is try to understand when the repairs are most likely to turn up. So 
to sort of give you a, a wider sort of uh, explanation. After we fitted the kitchen, we tend to sort of fit and then we sort of wait with the, for the customer to report or repair to us. But what we've never done is st stood back and looked at the repairs for kitchens after they've been installed um, and try to work out in which year would it be best for us to maybe schedule a service visit to uh, you know, reconnect the doors, you know, to make sure everything's all how it should be, or to perhaps put the kickboards back underneath the cupboards. And it's at that sort of level uh, that we're trying to pick these things up. And what I want to try to understand is whether we could put a service schedule in place for some of these main sort of components of the home so that we can keep on top of them rather than reply, relying on a repair service. And it's important that we try to gauge uh, how much those repairs are, are costing us, because that's actually how they, we, we, by saving that money, we're able to fund um, this, the service visits. Uh, just sort of saying here, this is a unique opportunity, I think, in housing. I don't think many housing associations have really laid that sort of data bare to uh, organisations and said, pull this apart, you know, tell us tell us what we could do better. Be really open and honest about it and say, actually, can we can we identify these these homes? How how we how quickly can we do that? Are there some trends that maybe we could say this property looks like it's heading that way, um, you know, before it actually gets there? We've got a, a group of properties, uh, quite a large group of properties through a, a project called SmartLine, where we've put additional sensors in the homes uh, and our customers have been really, really supportive of those. Um, and that's been quite an eye opener, to be fair, um, you know, looking at data sets in terms of temperature, humidity and the internal environment of people's homes. And, and I see this as sort of as not, I probably not as um, intuitive as, as actually looking at the data sets from a sensor point of view, which is live data. But I think this sort of unpicking of our data models um, and be able to sort of see where these properties may be, may be lacking, um, that would be a really interesting project. And I think the other thing is where we're trying to sort of identify customers who maybe haven't reported the repair in the last four months, or they may have only reported two repairs in the last six years. And trying to pick those sort of properties up because actually those customers might just need a little nudge uh, and a bit of support uh, in reporting the repairs to us. So I think it, it is a really unique opportunity and I think um, I think it's something that um, will be seen very, very sort of positively by a lot of associations because once you develop sort of the models and the approach, um, I think we can share that information uh, much wider uh, and get some really good sort of publicity in terms of how beneficial this really is. And I can give an example of, uh, you know, using the sensors where we had a customer who had fallen on some unfortunate times and we spotted that um, the temperature dropped in the property back in February. It was very cold outside um, and we simply uh, you know, intervened, uh, spoke to the customer and sort of after a couple of conversations managed to put a bid in for some funding for them. Um, and they got the, the funding which they were entitled to, um, to get some uh, money towards heating and we also provided some some finance uh, financial help ourselves from coastline uh, through one of our support mechanisms so this is really important stuff i mean it, it changes people's lives and i think everyone wants to really feel supported i'd say i didn't just um, make the, the presentation very long on purpose because I, I think i'd rather get uh, any questions out of the way if you have them please fantastic uh, thank you mark that's um, really um Fun, really interesting challenge, but also, I think what sticks out for me is that it's it's for social good. It's it's you know it's it's about helping people. It's not it's not just about maximizing profit. It's about using the information at our disposal to try and help people live more comfortable lives and to actually you know um, when there's a repair that needs to be done, it's not just about uh, efficiency for you as a business. It's about you know minimizing disruption for for your residents as well um, and your story about sort of spotting um, you know a drop in temperature and then kind of proactively helping I think that's the direction we want to move to because prevention of issues is much better than having to deal with um, something that has gone wrong that wasn't spotted so so thank you very much and as I said earlier um, I've always been impressed uh, you know not everyone has a high opinion of housing associations and <laughs> and so on but I've been really impressed and other people have also said that um, you know, Coastal and Housing is, is one of the good good organisations that really, really works for the community. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I've got a few questions which I'll kind of get the conversation going with. Um, and if anyone wants to ask a question, please do kind of unmute and ask. 
or if you'd like to kind of um, not show your kind of you know camera, you can ask uh, in the chat and I'll ask on your behalf. Um, the, the first question that comes to mind is, um, what work has already been done in trying to kind of explore the data and and find some of these correlations and 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 kind of connections? Has has anything been done, or is this is this very new? Yeah. So we so we have some um, and the, the terminology that's used is SSRS reports. So some reports that we pull from our system, which um, highlight um, properties where there haven't been repairs reported for say I think it's twelve months and six months, if no repair at all has been reported, um, and those are passed to uh, the area surveyors. So we have a group of four surveyors, and they all have a distinct sort of set of properties uh, around sort of uh, twelve hundred each, um, and uh, they basically then. They get to knock on those doors and sort of try to find out what, what's going on and quite often with the challenge that we come across is those customers are quite vulnerable and they'll or they may just palm us off and say actually there, there's no repairs i don't have anything to report but that doesn't mean the property is at the standard that we would like it to be at and I, yeah and you know again sort of just sort of discuss the the, the um, disrepair angle that when a disrepair surveyor goes in they try to find absolutely everything that's in that property uh, and so we still need to have a really good protection from that. And I think the, the key message for me with, with disrepair is that it's very easy for a disrepair case um, uh, to be successfully defended, um, but still cost £20,000. And actually £20,000 we could spend in a really good way to really benefit the customer. Um, and yeah. I think that's what I find really aggravating about the whole disrepair protocol. Yeah, yeah. And, and do you find that um, uh, when you do engage with residents, um, once the conversation happens, that you're actually trying to prevent issues from arising and to better spend money. Do you, do you find they kind of click and understand, ah, uh, now I understand why you're trying to do a survey of my home or why yeah. you're kind of asking me, does that kind of transformation happen? Yes, yes. And we've got some, some really good customer groups. Um, so we've got a scrutiny group uh, at the moment. They've been looking at uh, condensation mold damp in, in people's homes and trying to sort of completely unpick that. And they're looking at the information that we're passing out, but also what other information could we sort of provide to customers and how could we support better? Um, and you know, part of our, our approach has been for the last sort of about 10, 12 months now has been sort of doing the police proactive surveys, asking, have you got any mold in your home? Which room is it in? Is it in the corner? Or is it more than sort of a square meter? Because that's a problem, you know, and we want to deal with that. But I think, you know, one of the bits of feedback from that group um, on behalf of lots of customers is it's really nice to sort of to get more information about why it's important when you've got that first initial problem to report it. Mm. Because actually, once you get to a certain point, it now becomes slightly embarrassing, I think. Uh, and so in the scrutiny group fed back that uh, customers had said that they thought, oh, well, it got out of hand and I was a bit embarrassed really because now it smells and it's a bit of a mess and uh, and we can still deal with that. That's not a problem. And I'd rather they rang us, you know, than, than yeah. sit at home wondering who they should call um, yeah. because we can deal with it. It's, not, it's not, a, not a huge problem for us. And it may be nothing to do with their lifestyle. It may be nothing to do with condensation. It could be water dripping through a, a gap in a roof or a gutter leaking backwards into the cavity. It could be a, a whole host of things. So it's sure. best that we, we know as soon as possible. Yeah. But feedback from customers is really good. Um, I mean, in particular around smart line and uh, use of sensors and where we've sort of intervened and nudged customers a little bit about whether they've been underheating or overheating slightly. Um, that's been, they've been really well supported uh, with that. And, uh, and yeah, very positive. Yeah. There's a question from the audience, uh, Inaya. Do you want to ask this yourself, Inaya, or would you like me to repeat it? Um, it says, uh, do you have any data concerning typical periods that routine servicing visits set off disrepairs by? So and we, go on. There's a part B to that, which says, do you keep a log history of reasons that residents have given for turning you away um, or what strategies convince them to let you in? Yeah, so uh, when a customer turns us away, uh, it basically goes through a, a little short procedure. Uh, and uh, the first thing is uh, another phone call. So we, we then um, go back to the customer again, saying, can we book another appointment for the repair? Um, that can happen twice um, where we and if we don't get a, get through on the phone call, it won't get dropped. We, we continue again and then it gets logged on the system, which basically is picked up by the area surveyor again. If the area surveyor is unsuccessful, it goes to the operations uh, operational maintenance manager, uh, who is one of my, my team. And um, and 
then we'll we'll make inroads then with our uh, tenancy team uh, and sometimes with our income team to see what's going on at the property is there any other sort of intelligence that we need to know about um, and eventually we do tend to get into those properties um, but we but we do get some um, where it's really difficult and and sometimes you do find really quite tragic sort of circumstances where someone maybe the leader of the household has passed away and that's that can be really difficult really challenging for the people and they don't want to see anybody else they just want to sort of grieve and get on with things and mm -hmm. sort of report something at some other time um yeah. but um yeah i, I, I think it, you know, a lot of this is is around that support mechanism and trying to highlight where actually this one you know this particular circumstance just looks like it's going the wrong way because that's when we want to be able to intervene yeah um there was a part the, the first part of that question is around the the kind of the, the typical periods that routine servicing is it set off disrepairs by does that mean that's anything to you? not exactly but we uh, we routinely service uh, all heating systems so they're all, all regardless of whether they're gas or any other type of heating they all get serviced every year um, and then electrically only based heating is serviced every five years as part of the electrical um, inspection um, and then other elements such as the externals of properties they're painted and repaired um, every seventh year um, and so that so there are servicing routines for pretty well most uh, products in the property other than these very static products which is sort of around the kitchens the bathrooms the roof itself so those tend to be picked up on the stock condition survey which is every fifth year um, but i think it's this is sort of slightly different from the point of view of using the repairs information to say don't wait for the stock condition survey at five, year five when you fitted a kitchen if you had a service visit at year three that would that would make sure that that asset was well installed in the first place and hasn't been subject to any abuse and the products aren't failing because we've, we've had product failures in the past as well um, yeah. all through the manufacturing process so yeah. we do have comprehensive maintenance but this is trying to be i suppose a little bit more innovative and a bit more proactive and saying we want to lead we want to we want to be really good at this and, and we're quite good now um and yeah. i think that uh, i think it's a good opportunity to, to be even better so a practical question for me is um you know if if people wanted to kind of have a go and explore the data and and try and kind of you know uh, visualize or reveal correlations and and trends and 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 just to kind of you know calculate uh, you know time to just time to repair or time to failure what sort of data set could they get their hands on? Um, is, there a, is there a subset of your data that you've made public or how would you like people to kind of approach you and, and, and get their teeth into the data? Yeah, so the simplest way is a, a, an email to me uh, at Coastline. Okay. And um, then what I'll do is I get the, I've already got one version, but I, I get the IT guys to, to run a script um, to pull as much information out of the system as we can, which will be, um, around the repairs the maintenance side the house the yeah the actual property details uh, as well as the customer details to a certain level um sure. we'll, we'll do that and then we just need to be a bit more mindful of gdpr um, sure. and whether we need to put a, a data sharing agreement in place sure so this is because this is about residents and it's you know potentially um personal information it's not information that you're putting on the web anywhere it's it's no. something people have to come to you and and, and uh, sign an agreement with okay yeah. and well, we've that, done that's... that previously with uh, the partners who are in um, smartline so we sure. set up data sharing agreements with with everybody in smartline um through the university and then we shared quite a lot of obviously a, a lot of information through there yeah, um, yeah. fantastic and if there was some um, you know uh, there's you know within the rich data that you've described there are all kinds of questions that could be uh, answered you know such as you know you know what's the mean time to failure and what's the correlation between somebody being in a position where they need support compared to say temperature there's lots of questions that we could come up with that are usefully answered for you what would be the top two or three questions that you wish could be answered by a data exploration exercise what, what, what's yeah, your wish list <laughs> yeah it's, it, that's, that's quite a difficult question because because I, I don't know what we're going to find i think it's, it's probably one, one way of me getting out of the question slightly but um and i'm not trying to completely avoid it but i think it's trying to how do we do this better yeah uh, what what is that data telling us is it telling us that actually what we should be doing is and, and that would be really sort of quite 
um, refreshing from a certain point of view is the data standards actually we don't spend enough time checking up on our homes and our customers and we should actually start to think about how we do that more regularly and particular subsets of customers you know who may be slightly more vulnerable or their properties are slightly older maybe sure. does that sort of make sense because obviously to have a, a a group of surveyors who go to every every property every year it, it would be mind-blowingly difficult and, and extremely expensive but if we could target it a little bit more then I think yeah. then we, we could sort of work with that and, and change the way we do things because it would release the same surveyor's time for not having to deal with the repair in a month or six months or a year's time. Yeah yeah fantastic. Are there any questions from from the audience for the attendees? Fantastic. Yeah, so um, in terms question. of, go, oh, go for it, Glenn. I'm trying to find the mute. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, do you, do you put a cost of repairs in, in the data? Yes. So obviously, one of the things you kind of want to correlate is, you know, you said about kind of judging the cost of repairs against perhaps the time it was reported versus the time, you know, how bad it is and things like that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so so we'll, we'll provide all cost things will be in there as well. And sometimes what happens is uh, there's an initial cost, so for a call out to make something safe, and then a secondary cost. Uh, so you'd see that second cost as well, because it's all yeah. related to the original um, request. Uh, another question, sorry, uh, was the bit, obviously people move around as tenants. Yes. Uh, and how that does that have an effect on the data and skew the data? Because if you're talking about kind of demographics of people in households, it may not always be the same people in that household. Yeah, and that's here's something that we uh, we did come across um, with SmartLine, um, where we've retained some of the sensors now in homes and separate. You know, another customer's moved in after the previous customers moved out, and you do see slightly different profile uh, of say heating use because there maybe their work patterns were different or the family uh, build up is slightly different. Um, so yeah, so, th there would always be a slight change, but we would tell you when the change happened. We would yeah. know that. So we would know, yeah, we can see that in the data. We can see yes. the change. Okay. Cool. Thanks. And I should add, uh, one of the other things that I was looking to do was uh, the the area surveyors take really sort of really good ownership of their their dwellings, if you like, their group of homes. And in a Q and A type session, uh, if we can go ahead with this, um, I would like quite like them to sort of come online and we'll we'll do a Q and A sort of session once you sort of got a feeling for data and it, it starts raising anomalies that don't sort of make sense. Um, I think that'll be really useful for them and and for whoever was looking at the data sets. That's a good idea. Um, so, um, in terms of uh, going forward, um, if if you um, uh, if you're happy to share your email or, or a contact me method, yes. I'll share it with the group. Um, some people will want to just you know work individually. Some people might want to work in a group. Um, and what I'll do with all the challenges is in uh, eight weeks' time, in a couple of months' time, we'll organise kind of a get together of of all you know. The, to catch up on what people have been working on. Um, some people will say, ta-da, you know, this is what we've done. And some people will be working more closely with you. Um, and, you know, we'll play by ear. And if, if, if there are interesting insights that emerge, um, we can have that kind of conversation with the, with, with the, with the kind of the property um, people. Yeah. Um, fantastic. That, that's, that's great. Um, it's interesting. SmartLine is also presenting a challenge as well. So <laughs> there may be some overlaps there. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, Smartline been, to... has been sort of really, was really groundbreaking when we originally started the Smartline. And I remember, you know, it's quite some years ago when I first started writing and I wrote in some of the housing, one of the housing magazines about, you know, if we could just get that insight into people's homes a little bit earlier, we could deal with things much easier uh, and improve lives. And Smartline is certainly proving that. Um, yeah. the, and it's only, you don't need to have absolutely you know loads and loads of sensors all over the property you just need to know the basic things because they're the flags when it's cold and it's cold inside that's an immediate flag that actually we can deal with that um, yeah, so, yeah, so sometimes the very simplest information is is the most useful yeah absolutely um i've got a final question which is um slightly tangential it's a kind of about the industry as a whole so um you know coastline housing is you know, very admirably looking at um, making more intelligent decisions based on the data it has. And clearly to do that, um, you know, you need people who can work with data, who have that kind of skill set, have that training or that kind of academic background. Um, as, a, as an organization that's really well established, um, 
from your perspective, what are the barriers, do you think, um, in uh, more Cornish businesses take, you know, going in the direction of being uh, data and data insights led businesses? Is it the fact that actually they don't know the opportunities there or they don't know that um, yeah. data can be that, that insightful? Or is it actually difficulty in recruiting and, and, and finding people? What's, what's your experience? So I think you're talking from a housing perspective, but probably it, it probably does echo with, with other businesses as well in Cornwall, um, that I think you know, a lot of the other types of businesses probably don't have the data sets probably as accurate as we've got um, because housing has been quite heavily regulated over the years so we've had to have good systems in place and had to keep things up to date here we do have inspections uh, you know uh, and um, I think that that's been sort of a bit of forced position which is our norm if you like but a lot of organizations don't and a lot of organizations are only you know through through COVID um, um, digitizing and starting to sort of mobile work and, and and all the other things that have come through through the COVID sort of restrictions. So they haven't really got a generous sort of uh, data set for someone to sort of start looking at, but they probably sat there wondering, um, particularly if they've got maybe lots of properties, lots of assets and uh, or those, or, or they're creating lots of data. They're probably wondering what, what it tells them, where, where could they save money by doing something early? Um, and I think, yeah, that, that's that's probably really financially sort of um, uh, appealing to a lot of organisations is that actually by doing things quickly, easily, early, we can save, you know, save some some money somewhere. Um, and that's not about making people redundant. It's, a, it's about just if you let the plaster go bad on a wall for six months instead of two weeks, then you get to spend money for no good reason really on that yeah. property we could have diverted yeah. that money to somewhere else yeah. and i think the other thing is there's probably in a lot of organizations there probably is a slight nervousness about what you might find if you look if you pull through our data what were you going yeah. to find um and i've got to be honest i don't have that so uh, and i think coastline is you know we're really open about our data and what the, the things that we hold um, and if we get things wrong, we stick our hands in the air. We, we, we sort of, uh, we do tend to work that way. And so that's a slightly different ethos. But uh, yeah. I, I'm quite confident that um, I think there'll be some really interesting sort of outcomes uh, when soon people look at the data. And I think there'll be some re initially some really interesting questions about well, how how can that happen? Like, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, that's brilliant. Um, somebody's asked, um, um, how can we reach out to you for the data? Where can we get the email address? If you afterwards, um, if you email me the address that you would like shared, I'll email it to uh, everyone in the in the in the dead science group, um, so they can contact you. If, if yeah, it can go straight that. to my my email address, which is uh, yeah Mark England at Coastline Housing or one word dot co dot uk. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I can I can email you back with that. Yeah, uh, it's the one I've got, so I'll share that yeah. with everyone. Okay, brilliant. Um, so um, the um, Mac dot Lex who asked the question, um, keep an eye on your inbox. I'll I'll I'll, I'll email that to yeah. everyone. Okay, brilliant. Fantastic. Well, th thank you very much for a really interesting um, um, a challenge. Um, and there's loads of potential in this one because I can see there's lots of very varied kinds of data, lots of questions that could be asked and then proven or disproven through the data. So uh, yeah. I hope that's inspired uh, people. Um, uh, there'll be, I'll put this on YouTube as well for those people who couldn't quite attend today. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I hope, I hope uh, something thank interesting you. comes out of it. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Okay, Thanks. take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.